Okay, um, I think we can move on and we can start us starting to introduce the movie star of the department, who is our one and only Shaharia. So he's used to this by now. So he's going to give us a very professional take on his experience so far. Well, well no pressure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to keep this short. I, I was trying to think about how, you know, how this experience of diversity, like how did I become aware of, of this? Um, and I'm embarrassed to say, I mean, I'm a late bloomer in general. Uh, I, I'm embarrassed to say that this was another thing that I recognized pretty late in my life. So I grew up in, in Pakistan and I was sort of the just a regular guy over there um nothing really outstanding or or uh diverse or anything about me i was just a normal guy and then i moved to the states um and this uh, i moved to the states in 98 um at that time in the 90s we were getting american TV shows and things in, in Pakistan. So, you know, we were watching Friends, we were li listening to Nirvana. And basically, I felt like I knew everything that I needed to know about American life, right? Because Friends and Nirvana, that's an accurate representation of what was happening. Um, so I moved uh, there and I started work in Chicago. Um, and this was still high school. I was taking college classes on the side, but I was working in an office setting, um, working for the, the phone company in there. And if you guys know Chicago, Chicago has a long history of discrimination, particularly against uh, African-Americans. It's been uh, well-documented, lots of uh, problems uh, in particular in Chicago. So I used to work with um, uh, African-American colleagues who would talk about uh, racism all the time. I mean, it was high up on the discussion. Uh, it was high up on their agenda, high up on their minds. Uh, and we would often talk about it at lunch. And I was convinced that they were lying. I'm going to say that again. I was just convinced that they they were just trying to get benefits. And because the US, we knew, was this place where you worked hard and anybody could be anything they wanted. And that was my, my belief. I mean, I'd moved to the States and I look at me, I found a job, even though, I mean, I'm a bit of a parrot, so I can I could mimic an American accent reasonably well. Uh, but I was like, oh, you know, I work hard. I'm working in an office like this. There's no discrimination, obviously. Um, okay, so. Not proud of it, but that's what happened. Then I moved to Texas. Now, nothing against Texas. Uh, Texas is actually really great. It was one of my favorite places. But I moved just around, uh, I moved there in August of 2001, about a month before the sort of discrimination landscape changed temporarily. I would say that happened temporarily, and now it's gone back. Uh, but at that time, then September 11th happened, um, all of a sudden, uh, Muslims became the sort of number one. And, and, and you know, my, my, I had, so in Dallas, uh, I, I don't know if you guys know about this part about me, but I was a stand-up comic for a short time in Dallas. And my, my African-American comedian friends, who would often joke about that, that after, after September 11th, the racial disparity changed and they were loving it <laughs> because the Muslims were the new sort of hated community. Now, there's a few experiences I could relate uh, of things uh, like overtly discriminatory things that I had heard, had said to me, insults uh, and so on. But um, but the thing was, all, all of a sudden, I'm applying for job interviews. I'm not getting callbacks. I mean, this this is more sort of serious thing than just somebody randomly at a bar, you know, uh, throwing something at me. This is more structural, right? Uh, um, all of a sudden, my name was this odd thing that people didn't even really want to pronounce. Uh, I would have trouble finding roommates. Uh, I could uh, call people, ask them if they had an apartment for rent and, and so on, and people didn't really want to rent with, to me if they, if they could help it. Um, and so slowly, slowly, different aspects of the discrimination 
experience crept into my life. And that's really when I'm embarrassed to say, I mean, and, and maybe that's true for a lot of people who are in privileged positions that it's hard to see until it starts to start, starts to happen, uh, starts to happen to you. Um, and so since then, I what motivated me to also do a little bit of research in this area as well is that I just look at myself and I say, wow, isn't it funny that I was just a couple of years before September 11th, I was convinced that my my uh, African American colleagues were making it up, were making up risk, uh, discrimination, and all of a sudden, after experience it, experiencing it, I started to understand and internalize what was going on, and the and the ways, the many different ways in which it manifests itself. So I'm going to stop there. I also have an answer to the question that Krista posed about what how how do you feel when people ask you. Uh, uh, or tell you that you speak English really well. I have an answer to that, but I'll leave that for the uh, for for the remainder. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shaharia. Um, I have questions for you, but I think I'll get Joel to come in first and then sort of couple them as questions for staff members of the school. So, Joel, are you happy to come in on video as well? Joel? Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay, so I've had some problems this morning with the IT. I was hoping to have this meeting in my office, but um, it, it's, the gremlins are, are not uh, not behaving today. They're in wild mood because I, I was teaching directly before this and there are a few problems there as well in this room as it happened. So I came back here and um, anyway. Um, my experience uh, is different um, because I, I'm pretty much brought brought up here. Although I wasn't born here, I came over as an immigrant. Um, well, obviously, I, I, my family brought me, so I had no um, no say in the matter. Um, I remember crying, but that didn't seem to cut any ice. Uh, and I, I, we were poor, and I went to the East End of London. And um, having spent the first ten or eleven years of my life glazing around the beach, eating mangoes. Um, it was quite a shock to to arrive in the East End of London uh, to a secondary school that um, one or two people were coloured and um, everybody hated you. Um, in fact, even the coloured people hated you. So um, it, it was quite a, quite a shock. And for a long, long time, I didn't really think seriously about the problem. I just dealt with it. So. Um, Fighting was a was a big thing, and um, getting into getting into problems beyond that uh, sort of punctured my life um, up to, I guess, um, getting going to work. I like all I think most uh, Asian heritage people. Your parents want you to be doctors um, or earn lots of money doing something very similar, like accountancy. Um, and that was it, you know, nothing else mattered. So I didn't know about economics at all. Um, I applied, um, you know, I was the first to go to university, my, uh, of my siblings and my family, I think. So nobody knew the process uh, of, of getting higher enough education to, to, to get admitted. And this was years before um, places that were, uh, were allocated to people based on particular demographics. I, I started working um, and got uh, had to work night school to get A levels and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, getting into economics uh, for me was was like many people an accident. I think I wanted to actually go to Sheffield and uh, do Japanese and business, um, and the course was full. And they told me to they apply again the following year because I would have, you know, I would had um, enough merit to get to get in and um, my father was a didn't want that uh, he wouldn't have that at all so I had to go and work um, that was you know was, wasn't a matter of debate um, in fact I'm not even sure that he knew that I'd apply to university but that's a, a different story anyway um, and because I couldn't get in and I knew that if I just didn't go 
um, I would be, be forced to do other things that may not um, I may not have liked. I looked around and found um, an offer for economics and business uh, in Manchester. So I went there and that's where I started. And I was thinking about this question about how we get into a subject and uh, influences. Um, there was one person who was actually a coloured man who switched me on, you know, like a switch. It was it was incredible. I remember the day very, very well. And the charisma of the guy um, was astonishing. The first lecture he talked uh, that, that, that I went to was um, the history of economic thought. And he stood up with, um, I think it was Adam Smith, and he'd previously given us the readings to do. And so we knew what he was talking about because I was a diligent student. Um, and then he went through and line by line created algebra out of out of text. And, you know, that, that was astonishing to me. And the way he was doing it and what he was saying made so much sense. I thought, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be able to. And when he stopped, everybody was silent. And then everybody, as a group, got up and applauded. And I didn't realize it then, but later looking back on it, it had a significant impact on what made me want to do economics because it, it, it drove me to try and understand what people were actually saying. Uh, I think my influences are two, twofold, either as people who influence me in what they have achieved and people who have influenced me from what they've written, what they say about economics and um, uh, or, or, or similar. For example, one of my written influences is David Hume and his treatise on government. If you ever get the chance to read it, you should, because it tells you so much about why people do what they do and how they do what, sorry, what what is the effects of what they what they do? So it's he, he, there are a number of treatises he's written in in his essays, but uh, the point I'm I'm making is that there is always in education somebody that is able to switch on somebody else, and that's maybe one of the reasons I wanted to do it because um, if you spoke to my ugly sisters and there's a number of them, um, they'd all say that uh, I would be the one who was going to be the teacher because I was always telling them what to do and how it was things worked the way they worked. I was always interested in the way society worked or the way machines worked or way the people, why people do what they do. And um, to a certain extent, economics allows me to examine these things in, in detail. And so I fell into economics because of Mike Pine and because that was the name of the guy um, in Manchester who, who, who delivered that lecture and because of my curiosity of, of, of how the world was was working and of course to get away from my father which um, is a, a different story so <laughs> that that is it um, with respect to the the people who've influenced me via their writings well um, I'm, I, I really get switched on in in two ways the theory of why things work the way they work and the mechanics of how to measure them and um, I know you all, you, you all play this game when you uh, are a postgraduate student or a PhD student, you have to put on your um, a resume of what type of economist you are, what is, your, what is your niche area. And I wanted to be a macroeconometrician because I like the, the way the mechanisms worked and I wanted to measure these things and I liked macro. And macro this time and certainly back then wasn't a popular subject. You know, macro was not a was not a star um, in in the stellar of um, economics. But after leaving um, university, I went to, to work in um, first in uh, estate, uh, real estate, housing, effectively, and uh, later on in banking. And I worked uh, in the banks. Um, I did backroom stuff, so I uh, programmed machines to talk to each other uh, and built business uh, reporting models uh, because I, at the time I started training us to be a qualified accountant. But after I finished my undergraduate, I thought, well, um, somebody at a big bank, a very, very big bank, um, one of the big banks, 
uh, offered made, made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I'd already accepted to go to a PhD by this by this time. So um, I had to come up with a way of uh, of refusing uh, a fabulous offer. Um, so I had to make the PhD worth it, if you like. Anyway, um, so I, I I went to from banking into doing my PhD and. Uh, I've, I've been teaching banking ever since. So that's me. No quest oh, questions for Joel. Did the fact that the professor who inspired you was uni was colored play? I don't know. I don't I don't know, really. That's a good question, Krista. Um, I would hope. It wasn't, um, but I did know that he was victimized afterwards because uh, it also echoes some of my history here. Um, his expectation of the students was higher than the students' ability, and the head of school um, didn't like that because of po politics, I presume. And he was moved on. We found out a year after um, he he was only there for a year, so it may be other things as well. But did his colour make a difference to my uh, state of impression? No, I think anybody who came in and talked something that was um, inspiring and unusual might have done the same thing. For example, I'm in, I, I, I then went on to read things like um, Valrach and um, Totonement. I found Totonement so fascinating how um, price is discovered. And uh, I, if, if I was speaking to uh, Kenneth Arrow, for example, his, his writings inspire me. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, may, you know, I know Arrow is Jewish, uh, maybe, maybe religion. I don't know. I, is the honest answer. I, I think not. I think I was I was a I was an open I was an open mind at that time. Thank you, Joel. Um, I think I have a question that both Joel and Shaharia can answer before we move on to the two other panelists. So um, Shaharia mentioned something about his discovery of being, I suppose, an, an ethnic minority in some sense and realizing what that meant for him. And Joel also had a similar experience coming to the UK as a kid. Would you say being a lecturer now and maybe teaching at UEA, which maybe now is much more diverse, but didn't always used to be so, and teaching a classroom of, say, 200 students who are predominantly white or and then you notice in maybe two black students one Asian students who are from minority ethnic groups would, would you say that that sort of influences your thinking or how you act in those classrooms and trying to make those students feel like they belong because you've experienced this sense of not belonging if that makes sense is that something that comes to mind as a lecturer in the classroom for you happy for anyone to go first Shall I go first, Sherry? While well, you think about a better answer than I'm about to give, I think um, it's. I, sometimes I do. Sometimes I uh, I look at the audience and I think there's so few women. How can we expect to get better representation when we don't get more women? And then I look at the colour and I think there's so few coloured people. How are we expect to get representation when they don't come? And I ask myself questions rather than how I behave in front of these people, maybe I should do, but how is it that they didn't get here? You know, what's stopping them? Um, and some of that might be role models, I don't know. If, uh, but it might also be money, because certainly if um, economics paid, my parents would have forced me into being an economist rather than a doctor who wanted to be, a, you know, something that paid. So. Um, I look at the screen and I think, um, or now the screen, but then the classroom. I, I, I don't really look at the colour. I, I think, how am I going to deliver this to so many people and how am I going to gauge how they get on? So maybe in smaller groups, I might think a little bit more about who, who it is that's having the most difficulties. But in, in, in a big lecture hall, I have content to go through. I have considerations to make of, of time and um, uh, the rate of absorption and so on. So many other things come to my mind much before colour and diversity. But it's nice uh, when you do see diversity um, in, in, in a lecture, uh, you do 
you know, it does go in. I don't know if that's answer your question, really, Sherry. Yeah, sure. um, I, um, it's a tough one. I think I, I have to I agree with, with Joel here. I mean, in a big classroom, the only thing I could say contextually is, I mean, when teaching development economics, I have to, depending on how the class makeup is, I have to sort of remind myself that there's more that I need to talk about to get people to understand the developing country experience if they haven't come from it themselves. And so, in fact, for me, a lot of this goes in the opposite direction because I'm trying to sort of relay an experience that, you know, people of color have already experienced or they're aware of either in their surroundings or, or whatever. And so, so it's, it, in some sense, it tends to go in the other direction. The other thing that you made me think of, which is also something quite interesting, is, uh, and, and I think relevant to what Joel was saying as well, is you think about the hurdles that people have had to go through to get here. Um, and one can also sort of surmise that if you come from a sort of less privileged background, the hurdles that you've jumped through are probably longer, harder. Uh, so your average motivational profile that you have of people that are in my classroom that are coming from those backgrounds is probably higher. And in fact, I find that their engagement with me tends to be a little bit higher uh, as well. So. Um, in the classroom, that's it's hard for me to gauge whether or not. I mean, navel gazing is hard as well, but um, but certainly, you know, it colors the way whether I like it or not. It does color the way that I'm delivering my content. Thank you, um, Joel and Sherry. We'll come back to you with more questions. Please do leave questions for them in the chat as well. Um, Joel, just before Joel comes in with something to say. Um, our next guest will be Favor, and then after Favor, we'll have Darren. So, Joel, before Favor comes in. Uh, yeah, Sherry's Sh Sh just reminded me of some other things. I, 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 when I started my university learning, my undergraduate, um, it was clear um, I wasn't a, a stellar, stellar learner. And um, when in my master's and then later on in my PhD, I, I, I was able to teach other people all the frustrations that you learn both from your ethnicity you're facing and through the learning process are uh, you're able to recycle and help um, other groups so there was um, in in my case at Manchester there was a lot of uh, at the time ethnic um, Chinese who didn't understand economics but could do maths very well rather um, stereotypically as, as it is now and I, I was involved in in remedial classes for these people, just teaching them basic economics. And it wasn't uh, so much uh, uh, an issue of where they come from, but uh, just an understanding. They were very smart people. They just didn't they just didn't get the way in which we taught our subjects. And so um, some of my ignorance when I was learning was able to I was able to channel towards um, helping them in these remedial classes. I don't know if that um, that really focuses on the question at all, but that's there it is. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Um, there are a few more questions in the anonymous chat and in the meeting chat as well, but we'll get through Favor and Darren's um, short speeches before we get to those. So Favor, are you happy to come in now? Um uh, 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 uh okay. Uh so my name is Favor and uh, I'm an undergrad, second year economy student. And uh, so to give you a, a brief of my 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 life history, basically I'm a Nigerian uh, by birth and naturalized uh, British. Uh, uh, I, I I don't know if most of you know, but Nigeria has three major tribes, and I happen to come from the Igbo tribe, which is the south east of the region region and uh, I left Nigeria at age 13 uh, because my parents were like yo come over to the UK and uh, for a better life so I came to the UK and then 
to England and then straight to Northern Ireland. And in Northern Ireland, I spent a year in Northern Ireland uh, before moving to England. But when I was in Northern Ireland, we there, there were about 1,500 students in this secondary school, which was also a sixth form. And uh, I and my siblings, we were all the only black students there. And uh, it was kind of like this intriguing stuff because I knew I'm coming to a country where you had predominantly white people, but at the same time, I didn't expect it to be, uh, what's it called, as, on, uh, as it wasn't as diverse as I had perceived in my mind. So I spent a year there, but it was quite fun trying to integrate with people because I, I got to the point where I got tired of speaking because if I said if I say something to someone, the person would keep going, huh, 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 for like five times, then I have to spell individually everything I'm saying. So I was like, okay, I'm tired. I'm just going to keep to myself. It's a pain in, to try and communicate with most of these people. And I, when I was talking to them as well, uh, I would have to go, huh, huh, because I wasn't understanding what they were saying. Uh, spent one year there and then came over to, the U, uh, to England where... I went to secondary school, continued my secondary school learning in Nottingham. And uh, that was a fun experience because there were like uh, quite a couple of black people there as well. But I never experienced like racism per se in Northern Ireland. But coming to England in my secondary school, that was where all hell broke loose. It was like this back and forth. He likes me. He doesn't like me. And then you had obvious racist comments from a couple of people. I'm like... But I haven't even done anything. This guy once a time said, I don't like black people. I was like, we're not even friends. How can you hate black people if you've not been friends with a black person? So that didn't make sense to me. I was str struggling to find who to be uh, who to be friends with that I won't obviously like get into a racial argument with them about who I am and where I come from. And uh, then uh, fast forward, I came to uh, UEA and picking UEA was quite fascinating and interesting because uh, it was kind of like my way of escaping from my mom, who is super protective. So I was like, I got to find a uni which is far away and uh, a Russell group. So I decided to come UEA. But picking the subject economics, that was something I always loved because uh, I was my uncle is a subcontractor for WHO and uh, he, since I was six years old, he's always, you know, tried to prep me to be a, a medicine, uh, to be a doctor. And uh, when I came over to England and during the junior uh, doctor strike, I decided I can't deal with this life where doctors are striking. Why don't you just pay them a fair wage? So I switched to economics. And coming from like a poor background in Nigeria, I never, we never had a lot. So my aim has always been materialistic and money wise. And I feel like that played a role in me choosing economics because I was like, I need to understand how money works. But at the same time, I need to, you know, make money for myself. Because if you're Nigerian, you would understand that you have, I believe it's four career paths, a doctor, uh, an engineer, uh, a lawyer and, and a banker. And any other stuff is considered useless. So I was like, I got to find something that speaks to me, something that I would love and when I level, I had this uh, British Indian uh, uh, A-level teacher, and he really took me under his wings. He would explain stuff extraordinarily, and uh, I grasped economics from that point. I was like, this is what I want to do going forward. And then that helped me make my mind up uh, when I came to UEA. But uh, one other reason, uh, UEA per se, because uh, I'm a, during my first year, I never lived on campus. I lived off campus. So my experience is kind of different from like UEA students from uh, first year. So my first year experience was more like a bunch of people uh, in the lecture theater. You go and you make friends. And I'm the type to always make friends with at least one, uh, a diverse group of people. Because I have this to, I have this saying in my head that if the a room is filled with 80% British people and 20% uh, non-Brits, I would love to have at least one British friend and the rest non-Brits, because I'm trying to, you know, be more caught, uh, more diverse and trying to understand these people's background story, because I believe hearing other people's stories would help you become empathetic and also uh, understand where they're coming from most times. So uh, that was how I went around making my friends. But 
some of them just happen to be not to follow that trend. But uh, economics wise, uh, the School of Economics has been quite diverse for me. Uh, like you have root and then you have root in first year was when I uh, basically when I had root for the second semester for economics, it was kind of like this eye opener that you can have there's a black lecturer teaching me. Do, she she attends this position and she's at UEA, so that must mean it's not going to be a, a difficulty for me to uh, to get to have uh, to actually graduate because I was like this is going to be hard. I'm stressing myself until I seen root. I was like, yo, this is this might be possible because I have this type of stuff in my head that if I see someone from a similar background to me make it, then I know I'm likely to make it as long as I put in the hard work. And uh, seeing Root being the lecturer for the second year, mm -hmm. se second semester, that really puts me on a forward trend to, you know, get my first year cleared and uh, get on to second year. And that was kind of like a diverse feature for like the lecturer wise for UEA economics uh, school. And then coming on to second year, uh, then you have Ayo. Uh, I don't know how you said his name, but I believe he's Nigerian as well. So uh, that kind of puts me on track to like believe these things are possible like seeing a black lecturer teaching economics can actually from my point of view actually helps me uh better integrate uh not integrate wise but like better adapt to the learning situations because then i can understand ayo's accent because he's nigerian it's not it's it's not as difficult as trying to you know adjust my ear to understand other accents it's so that is my take on the lecture wise but UEA has been fantastic i mean there are events where you get to mix with people and all that but otherwise i really love the experience of UEA and uh, it's all good for me thank you very much favor i think that's a very interesting um, conversation or what you've just said to us. Um, before we address the questions, I know, because I'm sure we're going to have many questions and things to discuss. I really want to give Darren the opportunity to speak now. And afterwards, please keep your questions coming in the chat. I am monitoring them. I will distribute them <laughs> or ask the panelists the questions that you're asking. So Darren, are you here with us? Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Hello, so my name is Darren. I graduated from UEA this year. Um, I studied politics, philosophy and economics at UEA. So yeah, I've just started real adulting, which is not fun. Um, but yeah, life goes on. But yeah, um, I come from South Africa. I come from a race which is not commonly known. We are genuinely classified as colored people. So I come from that. I studied at UEA. Um, my experience at UEA was eye-opening as a best way to explain it. Um, I had, coming from South Africa, I thought I knew the most about Africa as a whole, realizing I knew very, very little, and I learned that very, very quickly. Um, the most surprising factor was for me was that two white people, one European and one French Canadian, were the people that actually opened my eyes to Africa for me. That was for me personally. Um, and that was through a module I did, Africa in the 21st century, and one was a very close friend of mine who, yeah, she got me onto everything. Um, a lot, I had questions that I had to answer, so some of them, is my experience different from someone coming from a white background? I'd say definitely. Uh, a lot of people tend to forget that Africa is not only a black continent. It, it, it's very different. It's very diverse. So for me, it was very different to experience things, especially when you're like, oh, no, I am African, but there's nothing else. Like people don't people don't wrap their around it. And then it made it even worse when you considered a race that shouldn't technically exist, which was colored. It's derogatory in the UK, whereas in South Africa, it's a norm to classify people as colored. Um, so yeah, that's 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 me in a nutshell. There's not much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I kind of wrap them through everything really quite quickly. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Darren. I think we'll have a lot of questions for you. So I just want to address one of the first questions that we got in the anonymous chat, and that is, um, what is understood by the use of the word privilege? So can white people come from a less privileged background? And just to maybe add a little bit to this, and this is to all the panelists, so I think there's often 
this whole question of do I have privilege? What is my privilege? Or some people feel they should be ashamed of their privileges or others feel they should use this as an advantage to help other people. There's a whole lot of conversation, especially in the past few months going on about social privilege. I, I would like to ask, from your experiences, because for example, Shahari has come from a majority ethnic group, I believe in Pakistan before you moved to the US. So, and you're not really seeing what people from African-American or African heritage were saying about the ex and discrimination they were experiencing can be viewed as a form of privilege because you didn't really have to experience it at the beginning. So there was that level of, you're not being ex especially bothered with what was happening or you're not experiencing it as much as others who were. And I imagine that Favor might have the same thing or Darren or even Jewel. So I wonder what, what would you say in terms of privilege? Is this something that you would say you've experienced as a person of color or is this something that only you think only white people do experience? Darren, would you like to start? Yes, just to get started into it, I think it's, it's very, we have to note that they, there's privilege in every aspect, whether it be race, whether it be everything, everything comes with its own privilege. Like, I mean, good looking people get more privileges than people that are not as good looking. And this this is the first thing. So privileges across the board, and it, it, it all depends on almost your circumstance and situation in which way your privilege is either going to benefit or hinder your situation. So when it comes to like me, maybe potentially that I wasn't a dark-skinned African, it could have been considered a privilege in my aspect. But if you look at it from my side, the fact that I wasn't a dark-skinned African made it that I couldn't, I couldn't get, I couldn't get along as easily with other Africans because it was a lot harder to notice me as an African individual. Um. Yeah, no, I I uh, agree. Thank and thank you, Darren, for for that comment. Um, in fact, you know, it's it's tough to to say. I mean, you because it, it's hard to define. I mean, we have uh, white people that come from poor backgrounds within the UK. I wasn't a I wasn't aware of this until I moved here, of course. But this north south divide uh, that is there, um, I've actually spoken. Uh, to people who who actually talk about this, right? Um, just in terms of accents, people judge you and might want to uh, keep you a little bit further away and so on. And so, in fact, uh, it's it's interesting that you bring this up because on the one hand, you know, we'll talk about people of color and white people having privilege, but then one can't forget that within white people, there's also different levels of uh, privilege where some are actually, it's non-existent. In fact, there's uh, in recent times in development economics, I teach about this, right? That inequality in developed countries has been s severe, right? To the point where we've been helping developing countries, but then within developed countries, within sort of what we would historically classify as privileged people, there's been massive, massive disparities. Um, so, so no, I don't. I certainly don't think this is a specific thing. And you know, I I appreciate that you you brought this back to that experience because, you know, I didn't recognize, I mean, I come from a major ethnic major, majority background. I'm Muslim. Uh, I grew up in a school, uh, and by the way, here's another story about how awful I am. I grew up in a school where there was one uh, Hindu um, a student uh, who was sort of our version of, uh, you know, underprivileged, I suppose, in Pakistan. And people would uh, make jokes about eating beef in front of him. Uh, and uh, everybody thought that was wildly funny uh, back then. And, you know, even he'd laugh it off and stuff, but we had no idea that that was, now that I think back about it, uh, it's it's a horrible thing, right? But you, you sort of, it, it's one of those things that you, you actually, I guess, need to some degree, you kind of need to experience it and listen to people and communicate with people to become aware of how well you're actually doing, how how, how poorly you're actually doing. Um, so thank you for uh, pointing attention to that. Um. <coughs> for me, um, can you hear me? 
so for me, there, there are two things here. One is um, privilege, uh, which to me is, is about access. And the other is um, privilege with respect to, uh, to wealth. And so it's often the case that you can get privilege without wealth and, and um, wealth without privilege. So in terms of the, 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 the privilege and access issue, I've always thought that um, that's always based on a class system. And in the UK, to me, it's always been that way. Um, and so I think by osmosis, you, you, you tend to take that in. Whether you have a, a view on it or not is another, is another debate. But um, for me, privilege and, uh, uh, and access is about class. There is a reason why um, up till very relatively recently, the majority of our, our lawmakers and our politicians, policymakers, were from um, certain parts of, of, of the social divide. What's important to me is, is, a, is social mobility within these um, boundaries, within these sub subgroupings. And so if I think about it at all, which um, maybe I should think about it more than I currently do, but if I think about it at all, it, it, it saddens me that um, the poor from wherever they are, whatever um, background they have, do not get access. Uh, and I feel myself sometimes privileged that I have access. I have accessed certain um, areas. When I was working in the city a long time ago, I was earning fabulous amounts of money. It made no difference that I was of a person of color because I was able to, to make money. And um, that allowed me to um, go to places to meet people who had access without money. And they had access because of class. So um, it, it, it is, in my view at least, still a prevalent issue in the, in the UK. As much as diversity is an issue, I think um, access through um, privilege is, is something also that uh, could do with a bit of attention and the, and the spotlight being shone on it. Thank you. Um, Favour, are you happy to come in? I'm particularly interested in, maybe because I relate with Favour in the sense that I am Nigerian as well, and Yoruba, I'm from a majority ethnic group, and when you moved here, your experience must be different from mine anyways, in the sense that you've moved here, and now you're a, cit you're a British citizen, and you identify as British, I imagine, I'm assuming, <laughs> no, sorry, okay. most Nigerians don't want to identify as British, I don't know why, but okay, so let's say you identify as Nigerian British, and you are now in this space where you are considered a minority, is this something that you are conscious of, or is this something that, how, how did this feel at the beginning, just changing? Okay. At the beginning, it felt extremely uncomfortable for me, because it was like, where, where can I go where you have like black people or so I can feel like I'm I'm among I feel like accepted that way but I gradually drifted away from uh wanting to belong to a specific group to just wanting to live my life to the fullest without having to try to identify into a specific group I just wanted to you know integrate with as many people as possible and uh, not having to identify as, as a black person or a Nigerian. I just wanted to, I don't know how to put it, it's just, I wanted to be free from the constraints of, oh, you're a black person, you need to hang out with black people, or you're a black person, you can't hang out with white people. I just wanted to be in a group where it was diverse and people in the group respected your views, your opinions without having to question you as, minority wise or less or of a pedestal than they are and when it comes to uh what's it called privilege wise uh my views are di uh different because most nigerians would have this idea that everyone in the uk have so much money that's what i thought when i first came to the uk until i came and i was i seen white people who were working class same as my parents so i was like okay that is interesting and Privilege wise, I would say it does affect black people in a way. Does it affect them same way as white people? Not necessarily, but it still plays a role on white people and black people. Because 
I'd say I have the privilege of being in the UK, but at the same time, when I was looking for my of my first job after GCSE, all my white friends had their parents had knew someone who owned a business. So it was easy for them to get fast tracked into the job. And whereas I had better uh, better GCSE grades, I had better uh, punctuality rates, but none of that mattered because their parents knew someone who owned a business. And my mom is not the type to integrate with people. She's like a, a conservative person who is like stay at home and do me only. So I didn't have that uh, connection to like gain a job. So I felt like, do I have a privilege? And I ended up handing out over 250 CVs, more, uh, changed my CV so many times, and I still never got one. But at the end of the day, I do think we all have our privileges. Does it differ? It differs, but I feel like black people tend to be on the lower scale when it comes to privilege wise. White people do have privileges, but not all white people because it it goes it has is socioeconomic it it's from it's 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 basically are you a working class are you a, uh, a a lower class or an upper class and that does play a role on your privilege thank you actually this leads very nicely into fabio's comment and this whole sense of belonging and probably also something that was mentioned earlier about sort of changing who you are to fit in. So just to read Fabio's comment, Fabio said he was talking to a student at the bar and she's a first year student and she's um, of African heritage, I imagine, um, very open. And But she was looking for her people, people who can understand her. And I assume that by her people here, Fabio means people who share similar cultural or ethnic background as her. And um, in asking why this was so Fabio was asking how, why this is important or if it is important. So I'm throwing the same question to the panel as well. Is this something that you think is important finding? I know Favor has touched on this, so maybe not as much as Favor on Favor as Darren, Shahari and Jewel. Is it has it ever been important for you, maybe not now, but earlier in life, finding people who were of the same ethnic background as you when you moved to a new place so you could feel that sense of belonging and feel that you fit in and in cases where you couldn't find those people, those your people, did you feel like you had to change aspects of your personality or your behavior or even your accent like Shahari mentioned to sort of fit in with the new group of people that you're now, you now have to sort of mingle with? Sorry if that's a very long question, but you can hit whichever nail you want to. <laughs> Um, can I, I, I can go first on this. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of when I, when I, <laughs> this is a very funny thing. Uh, um, and another little bit secret that I'm admitting, uh, <laughs> I should rescind my, uh, uh, you shouldn't record and let it on air, but anyway, all right, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, well, I, uh, when I first moved to the States, as uh, you know, I come from a household where, uh, you know, we're sort of conservative or whatever. And I remember one of the first things I, uh, I when I got on the plane, it was Swiss Air to take me over to Atlanta to go to college. Uh, I asked for a, a, a bottle of vodka, like a small little thing of vodka. And she was like, ah, as soon as you leave the country, you you open up, huh? That's what the air hostess said. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I guess that's true. I mean, as soon as I got on the plane, I'm like, give me some of that alcohol. So I got to this, <laughs> uh, to, to college and the Pakistani students would reach out actually. So the Pakistani students were, were there was, also stuff that you didn't know about in this new society, simple things like how to open a bank account, uh, you know, how to just different stuff on social norms. Don't throw, you know, don't throw candy wrappers on the ground, all of those sorts of things. And that bit of information, uh, the reason why it was comfortable for me to engage with Pakistanis at that point is they knew the stuff that I didn't know. Whereas other people didn't know the stuff that I didn't know. So they, they, you know, I found they would be, it would be easier for them to judge me for it. Whereas with Pakistanis, it would be less likely, but you can sort of flip that on, on its head as well, because they were Pakistani students. Uh, they were not 
interested in drinking alcohol. <laughs> They're good Muslim children, very studious uh, guys. I went to engineering school as well, uh, so very nerdy. Uh, and they would judge me for, for drinking alcohol. So I would have to hide my drinking of alcohol from them. Uh, and then from my other sort of non-Pakistani people, I would have to hide some of the weird behaviors that I had from, from Pakistan. So um, uh, I think one of the aspects of, of this comfort that you're talking about is the shared understanding. There's some sort of unwritten things that we all sort of understand uh, and we can communicate better. But on the other side, I was I was wanting more experiences. I was wanting different experiences. I wanted to... I wanted to buy some weed. I, I wanted to <laughs> find some mushrooms somewhere. Uh, I wanted to know what LSD was all about. And these good Pakistani Muslim boys who wanted A's in their class were not interested in helping me obtain those things. So it, it sort of depends, right? Uh, and yes, I did have to find myself act differently around different people for them to remain friends with me. I will say one final thing on this, though, is that um, about after three years, uh, I finally got up the courage to disclose to my Pakistani friends that I had been drinking alcohol throughout this entire time and hiding and dodging from them while I was doing this. Uh, and I remember this, this was in the evening after dinner. I was like, listen, guys, I have something to tell you. You know, I, I drink. And they <laughs> looked at me and they're like, uh, yeah, we know. <laughs> It's it's a college campus we've known for years, and and in that moment I realized that actually it's not that they didn't like hanging out with alcoholics they didn't like hanging out with assholes I wasn't an asshole so then they tolerated me for it so that was another bit of understanding about uh, my beliefs about how I would be treated were also sort of um, incorrect. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I, um, <clears throat> I was thinking about um, Fabio's um, question and um, how it was that uh, the student he met couldn't articulate what they meant by, what she meant by her people. I can understand it if he's an undergraduate, just arriving, wanting some community feeling. It's sometimes easier to be with people who you, who you are comfortable with rather than with strangers. Um, some of it might be homesickness and um, uh, uh, a family feeling that is, is a, a shared feeling of a shared experience of being, uh, uh, knowing about the country from which you've come and having uh, maybe going through similar experiences now being undergraduates, I don't know. Um, and so wanting her people um, might be all of these things. And, and certainly there is a number of um, SU societies that are based around ethnicities. And um, these, are, these are things worth telling the student about. One, because um, it keeps them, at least to begin with, uh, um, feeling uh, a, a comfort uh, with, with peers and um, people with, with perhaps shared uh, cultural experiences, but it also allows them the safety uh, of experimenting and meeting other people in other groups. Once they're in a, once you're in a group, once you're in a formal group. So, for example, um, one of my uh, enjoyments is 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 a, is a coach um, for various sports clubs, and um, it's you see that um, people do integrate more once they've joined a group. So. Um, they will integrate with other sports clubs, for example, and other um, cultural clubs on campus. And so joining a club just because it's part of your ethnicity or with, or with a small group is not such a bad thing for the undergraduate that begins that's, that's, that's the first year or something. How about you, Darren? What was your experience coming from South Africa to UEA? How did, did you feel like you've felt the need to find your people as well and what would that have meant to you if that was the case? Uh, I, I definitely did that. It, it, it's different. I think the first thing you do like especially 
while in my scenario, I didn't have the opportunity to kind of experience the Yukon my own prior to this or live here prior to, the, prior to studying there. So the first thing I did when I got there was trying to find people that were familiar with where I came from. So all I looked for was familiar, familiarity so that I could, I could feel almost like I belong here. So if I could find one or two people that understood what I was saying, when I was saying things, what I felt for, and, and all these little gestures that we take on, it would have it made a bigger difference in making your stay worthwhile. I, I think that's a nice opening. However, also in touch that regardless of the situation, we're always going to alter the way we are, I feel like. Because like me coming from South Africa to the UK, it was a very big shift in my life. But whether I liked it or not, I had to become... English in a sense, in order to just get through almost day-to-day -day activities. There's things like I'd never rather get on a bus in South Africa, never in my life. Whereas in the UK, it, it was normal. It, it was normal. So I had to adapt and change these aspects and behave in certain ways. Maybe the bus is not the best I like scenario, but you have to behave in certain ways in order to fit into the society quite smoothly. Like, I mean, you're really different. So now you don't know how to get on a bus, so now you stand out even more. Whereas if you have, I assume, a bit more familiarity with somebody who can who can turn around and tell, yes, this is like this, like Sherry was saying about how like his Pakistani friends helped him get through some of the things. Whereas when you don't really know people, you don't really know how to converse with a lot of English students. I came as a mature student also, so that was another different experience because everybody wanted to do very different things in comparison to me. Um, and these are aspects you take, but I, yeah, you, you do change to accommodate where you are whether you like it or not i do think it becomes a very very big factor in almost the smooth transition in living or staying or studying in a country that's not your place of birth yeah i i agree i think and i think james mentioned something here in the chat about him having to adapt his northern accent while moving when he moved to norfolk i think it's something that's common amongst human beings, we adapt, that's the whole adaptation theory or theory of adaptation, whatever that's called in sciences anyway. And so there's this whole tendency for us to sort of try to adapt to our changing experiences or changing environment. And I'll just say, maybe because I feel like I'm the one black woman on the panel in case of the student, I would say at times having had people might not necessarily mean having people of color, people from the same ethnic background as her. It could just be having people who she does not feel the need to explain herself to. Because I feel that that's something that many people of color often feel like, like the whole, do you, oh, your English is so good, comment, or, oh, your hair was curly yesterday, today is straight. And that doesn't always mean that you're trying to change to be white because you can straighten your hair. It's just, for me, I'm Nigerian, it's kind of our way of life. And like people that you don't feel the need to just constantly have to tell them why you're brown, <laughs> which is what I feel people ask when they ask, where are you from? Where are you really, really from? So, <laughs> so I think at times it's just having that sort of community. And in terms of how we can support, I, I hope um, Darren and Favor can also bring something um, here as well, especially having been a student, Darren, and Favor being a student, is how, what can ECO do? I know one good thing that we do is, at least we used to do when the world was normal, is that we had group meetings and group assignments and environment where students to sort of relate and have to engage with each other in a real space. But in this new world, do you have suggestions for us? In the meantime, while you're thinking about that, there's another thing that has emerged and um, Krista has mentioned this as well, which is the importance of role models. I think almost everyone on this panel has talked about someone who inspired them in some way. And more often than not, that person was a person of color, whether they noticed it at the time or not. And I, I find it's very interesting. And I think I'll just be from my own experience being Nigerian. I'm sorry, we tend to say that a lot, but being a Nigerian, it's I never really felt the need to identify a role model because I always felt like there was someone who had done it before. But and I, I know growing up, even as a young adult, when I would hear people say the first black this or the first black that, it always sounded so strange to me. Like, why is there a first black anything in 2016 or whatever? So 
I, I wonder, uh, but now moving to the UK and working with students, I see how important it is for so many people. And I can see why it matters seeing someone who has sort of done something that you're aspiring to, who looks like you and who has sort of beat the odds or the stereotypical assumptions of what people of a certain group should be. Would you say this matters in terms of the color of the skin? I know Joel has said it, he didn't really think it mattered, but for Favor and Darren, who are the students or alum on the panel, do you think it mattered for you? I guess Favor has touched on that. So maybe Darren, I'm just trying to cut time. Did you think it mattered for you having lecturers of color or people of color to aspire to? Um, I'm not really sure if it, if it was something that, that, that would be like a main focal point, but I think if, if, for example, I had my lecture for Africa in the 21st century, she was a South African woman who moved from South Africa when she was very, very young during the apartheid in South Africa and moved to the UK and lived there all her life and then from there moved to French Canada. Um, and then the, it was nice to get somebody that she inspired me a lot, especially regarding like diversity and getting through all of this. She inspired me a lot. And I think it again comes down to the fact that I was familiar with her. We had things we could relate to beyond a classroom experience. So automatically I put her as this role model. She wasn't a person of color. She was white. But the fact that she came from where I came from made the difference, I would assume. And I think that's a big thing. And I, I, also, I don't think it, 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 it's, it's always about color because a white lady taught me how to be as diverse as possible. It's, 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 not, it's not always this factor about race and, oh, only this kind of person can help you and be a role model in that time. So I do think we need to take into consideration people are role models for what they do to you, how they open your eyes to things and what, what sets them apart, whether it's familiarity or whether it's, it's things they say or it's just a different train of thought. And I think that's, that's the important bit, regardless of, of anything beyond that. It, it's, it's how they're going to change your views on the world. Yeah. Can I uh, jump in on on this, uh, Ruth? Sorry. Um, so uh, I I want to echo what what Darren is saying, and I and I'm reminded of this. Um, so I I didn't mention how I got into economics. Uh, one of my eco professors. Uh, I went to him once, and I was uh, you know t talking to him about. Um, the job he had we had very little in common actually so he was you know older Jewish guy you know I'm a young Pakistani guy whatever so I'm, but I would have these long conversations with him and one day I was just lamenting about my work I was working at the time and I was like oh this work sucks and all and he said well have you ever thought about doing a PhD and I and I looked at him and I said uh, Professor Duma I don't think I'm smart enough to do a PhD. And he looks at me and, and he says, and I'll never forget this, he says, who told you that you needed to be smart to do a PhD? And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, all it needs is perseverance. Right? That's, uh, and, and so I had this idea in my head about what, it, what was impossible. And by by saying this, right, that even dumbasses like you can get this done, it's basically I'm able to see something that I wasn't able to see before. And I think that's the whole point of a role model is that they, regardless of whether or not you share an ethnicity or something like this, they're able to make you see things that you could achieve that you weren't able to see in yourself before. And that's, that's really the beauty of it. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I'll, um, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that too. It's um, inspirational people come in all different colors, shapes and sizes. And that's inspirational being the main point rather than their ethnicities. Um, but being somebody up on the stage, I look at it the other way. I look around me and I, I, I lament at the lack of um, diversity in, the, in, in my classroom. And I've, I've said this to previous students, uh, what are you going to do when you finish? And they say, oh, well, go and to the city and earn pots of money and um, or, or go somewhere else. And I, and, I, and I think about why am they coming into this particular profession? 
And that's, um, is it because I'm not being inspirational enough? That's what it comes, comes around to when I think about it, if I think about it at all. I think about why is it that um, we're not inspiring the next generation as, as, as much as the bankers are doing uh, and money is doing. I'm, we're certainly, most of us here, I believe, uh, are not in it for the money um, because we're, we're here for, because we're driven by other things. And so we need to, I think, be inspiring to the people that we teach so they can see the benefits of our profession. And then there'll be more of them, I guess. That's what I, I think. Um, I'll just ask this question to Favor and Darren. So I don't mean to exclude the lecturers, but I'm very interested in terms of especially your diverse backgrounds and your experiences of lectures in an equal classroom. There's a lot of talk now about decolonizing the curriculum. And I'm too, Darren, you might be more familiar with it because this originated in South Africa. Um, and I know you've been passionate about this before. We've spoken about this before as well. So I, I wonder in a UEA classroom, learning about economics, how have you found what the content of what you're being taught? How does it matter for it to be diverse? Because it's economics and we're supposed to all be very objective and be reasoned and there's more mathematics than theory these days. So what does that, that's, that's something that comes to your mind. Is that something that's ever sort of been present in your mind that what we're learning is not so diverse and why are, I don't put thoughts in your head anyways, but so what would you say to that effect? Um, Favor, are you happy to come in or Darren? Oh yeah, uh, what would I say wise? I would say, uh, yeah, having like, not, uh, not only like a black lecturer, but someone who is not British, kind of helps uh, in a way, because at the end of the day, the economic students are not British only. There are students who are from China, from uh, other parts of Europe, from Africa as well, who are uh, attending these lecture theatres. And I feel like having lecturers who are not only British, but also Europeans and from uh, across the globe, that does help in a way to draw students' attention in. Because I was, back to what I said earlier on, having like a black lecturer who is actually Nigerian as well, kind of makes me focus more because I know it's kind of like that, uh, you see someone who's from Nigeria in somewhere you're not from and you kind of tend uh, to, towards the code, vibe with the person, but not in the sense of vibing with a lecturer, uh, and their lectures, but like you, you're more interested in hearing what they are, they're, they're teaching you. You're more uh, engaged. Whereas if it's with someone who is British, uh, you, you're like, oh, I can go and watch this video back again. Whereas if it's someone who is Nigerian, in my pers from my perspective, I'm like, I need to understand this. This person is actually saying, speaking uh, in the same uh, accent as I've grown up, and this person is saying things which I can grasp that is like broken down to uh it's not like uh big words in a sense but it's something i've i've kind of grown up with so it's easier for me to understand this lecturer versus this lecturer because of his or her background so to me it does play a role massive role i would not say entirely but it does play a role in me understanding the lectures and uh uh uh, uh going forward with uh, studying and stuff. Darren? Um, yeah, I'd, 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 I love this topic right? because it's, it's always really interesting and it's all people always have very, very different views regarding it and, and it's really interesting. Um, for me personally, I just believe that education is, is something that should prepare us for the world. It's something that should allow us to open up the world and use it to the best of our abilities. When we are being taught only a certain percentage of the world's knowledge, I really feels like it hinders every other possibility. So I have a brother who studied law in the UK and is now in South Africa, and it's a very different ball game for him now because now because the law is so dominantly British, it's it's UK law. It, there's nothing that's applicable in South Africa. 
which makes it very difficult for him. So if you look at that in a broad respect, then we need to learn a lot more because there's a lot more in the world. There's not only white male economists in the world. And and that's that's the big thing. There's, there's people from all over the world. There's all these different things. Yes, thought is the majority of what it is is based off of a wire, white male centric. And everybody's had this discussion. Everybody knows how it goes down. And that's it. However, I do feel that the more, even if it doesn't become, because I know we had discussion, it's very difficult to try and slot these things into a curriculum. Try and slot all this excess knowledge or what do you take out to try and fill it in with these kind of things. But let students know that there is this other knowledge. Let them know that it's available. Let people know that they are able to access it from X, Y, and Z, and then give them the ability and give them the opportunity to be like, if you want to, you can go ahead. And if you don't, that's also okay. But as long as you know something along these lines exists, because majority of the time we don't even know that it exists. Yeah, and just following on from that, I know I have heard students say things like, well, when examples are given about poverty, it's always from Africa. Or when examples are given about bad policy formation, it's always from one part of the world. Is that something that you would say you have experienced at UE? And I know at times people don't, when as a lecturer, you don't necessarily intend to offend anyone or to come across as some bias in your <laughs> lecturing. And those examples are not wrong either. But is there a tendency to sort of over-focus on certain aspects? <laughs> I'm so sure, yeah. Is there a tendency to sort of focus on um, these parts of the world in the examples that are given in your class? And being from a different ethnic background, does that affect you in any way if constantly the stories you hear about poverty are from Africa? So Favor and Darren, I would come to Favor first, but Joel has something to say. Do you want Favor to go first? Are you happy to come in? And I let, let the students go first. I, I'd like to hear what they think, but I, I do have okay. an answer to that particular issue. Okay, favor. I'll say I'm quite strong. I'm str I have strong opinions when it comes to uh, using Africa as an example, because you know the colonial history of Africa. And when people make reference to Africa as being poor, and then I'm just stood there staring at them, I'm, them I'm, and I'm like, now, Africa is not poor. If Africa decides to disappear, if Africa hypothetically disappears from the map, the world would struggle so much because so much natural resources come from Africa. But you keep hearing people make references to Africa being poor. And I'm like, Africa is exploited. So when I hear like the articles you read or like uh, lectures uh, from the textbook making reference to uh, Africa, and it being a third world country and all that. No, to African nations being a third world country. I'm like, but it's not though. If we can correct the mistakes of the past and Africa is, it can be truly independent, then maybe we can go past these examples of Africa is poor or Africa is a third world nation. And I feel like it, it offends me. Hearing it does offend me because I'm Nigerian, I know a lot of back in Nigeria, there were times when we, I was only able to eat two meals a day. There were times when uh, we didn't know when we were going to have our next meal. My mom and dad worked super hard, but it didn't change anything because the politicians are corrupt. But at the same time, why are they corrupt? It's because they are incentivized by the West to loot money from Africans and uh, not uh, share the African, uh, Niger African or more or less Nigerian wealth equally. And hearing that does offend me because I feel like my relatives are back in Nigeria and they are going through sufferings which has nothing to do with them. And then to hear someone say Africa as a third world continent, it, it does annoy me so much. So I'd rather, instead of saying Africa as a third world nation, uh, con uh, continent, uh, use a more clearer example. Instead of just trying to brand the entire Africa as a as a backward continent, because it it is Niger. You have places in Nigeria which are better off than other places in Nigeria. But saying Niger Africa or Nigeria as a whole, it just puts everyone into a melting pot of all of you are poor, all of you are backwards. It it, it doesn't help. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from Favor is historical context matters. And so what about you, Darren? Do you think it's just lazy? 
no offense, I'm not attacking you, Shahara, <laughs> to just keep using these examples or. I, I do understand, like coming from coming from South Africa, my experience is very different because South Africa is so westernized. It, it is a little more different in comparison to the rest of Africa. However, I did have this problem. I felt the same way in my second year. I felt the same way in my third year. We, why is every connotation to Africa always negative? Nobody ever turns around and says, you know what, hey, look at how great Africa did in X, Y, and Z. Nobody ever points that out. But whenever it comes to, let's discuss poverty, okay, let's make say, let's make Africa our focus point. When it comes to corruption, let's make Africa our focus point. Let's make all these aspects, that's when Africa becomes a focus point. But Africa never becomes a focus point from a positive aspect. Like, I mean, I live in Johannesburg, South Africa. San Dan City, reach a square mile in Africa. Stupid reach. But nobody ever brings things up like that. Nobody comments on things like that. Nobody discusses things like that because we always paint Africa in one dark black coat and that's it. Nobody really looks beyond that. Nobody looks at the potential. Nobody looks at what has transpired over the last. Let's, let's, like, let's not discuss colonialization, but let's look at what Africa as a continent has done from colonialization to now. It's, it, it's incredible. But we're not willing to look that way because it's, again, it's that one-sided picture. We paint it always the same way. And it's tough. It's, it's not easy being in an environment where you, you learn. And every time you learn about where you're coming from, it, there's a lot of negative connotations. I do understand it's very difficult, especially in development economics. It's very difficult to try and pinpoint these things and try and get different. I, do, I fully understand it. However, there is a lot to be grateful for. There is a lot of things to look up to. And I think all of us need to make that effort to look at Africa in a different light because there's a lot that's about to happen and I don't think people are ready for it, specifically regarding Africa. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I'd like to come in here and say, uh, first of all, the, uh, the University of East Anglia is trying has has working groups to decolonize the the curricula okay so to make uh one of the things to do is to 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 take attention uh, on some of these uh disfavorable attentions uh, out of the curriculum um so there is a working party to do that so maybe going forward it will be less intrusive and um less difficult for people of ethnicity um, to get these examples. But the other thing I wanted to say was that there are plenty of groups um, that I use, and um, I, okay, my, my subject is more technical, um, that is neutral. And as lecturers, we try, I, I try to be as neutral as I can. Um, and so if, if we strayed on those paths, then I think it's incumbent of all of us and, and the students too, to let us know. I, you know, uh, I, I say to students, why didn't you tell me this? I could have helped you had I known. But sometimes they say too late. And um, so it, it, some of it has to go both ways. If you feel um, slighted by anything, you should, you know, raise your hand and, and let us know. But certainly there is a problem recognized and university is trying to do something uh, to, to change in decolonizing the, um, the, um, the curricula. I would just Sorry, just before I, 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 will, I will have to go fairly okay. shortly because somebody wants to use the room I'm in. So oh, okay, I'm that's gonna fine. Have to we're about to round up now because we've actually straight up, um, we've extended okay. our time a little bit. But I'll ask her uh, um, go and then we'll take maybe one more question and round up. Um, so, yeah, uh, I just, <laughs> I, I want to apologize to Darren. He's just faced me in development economics uh, last year. So I was like on pins and needles saying, oh my God, is he going to out me? What's he going to say? Um, no, <laughs> but uh, I want to say, um, no, it, it's it's true. It's a, it's a difficult thing, uh, in particular in development economics, we sort of tread, have to tread this line all the time, right? And when you give historical examples, I mean, it's not just, you know, if you remember, Darren, from uh, development economics, of course, the two regions that we pick on is yours and mine. It's Africa and South Asia. Those are the two sort of historically uh, poor areas. But of course, we talk about, I mean, 
essentially, in terms of giving examples historically of what policies have worked, what haven't, and putting stuff in context is, I think, extremely important. So alongside that, we also talk about, um, you know, things like institutional theories of development to talk about how historically these things have come about and so on. Um, and so uh, it's it's important to kind of keep those in mind that even though we as lecturers also try to avoid or try to minimize this as much as possible, uh, sometimes it's inevitable, right, that you have to talk about things uh, because that, in fact, was the experience that happened. And rather than not talk about the experience or try to sort of minimize it or something, it's it's also equally important to shed light on it and say, this is where we came from. Uh, the future, who can say, but it's important to know where we came from. Thank you all very much. I don't know if there's any one last question or if there's any panelist that wants to, that has a burning desire to say something. You can come on speaker now or forever hold your peace. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, is, is there's, an, no, 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 there's one question about racial capitalism, but that's a very long question that I think maybe we will deal with later on. But it's about the theory of racial capitalism and this um, person wanted to know, sorry, my Microsoft form has closed, so I can't see the question anymore. But um, I think we'll round off here. Oh, Joel and Shahar, I want to say something. Yeah, sorry, if it, I just want to say that diversity doesn't, uh, you know, stretches beyond uh, ethnicity. It should also include race and uh, orientation and everything else. And not, it's not, shouldn't just focus. I mean, there's <clears throat> plenty of things to focus on, but um, we should be more inclusive than we currently are. All these issues about what's in the curricula, etc. But it isn't. Shouldn't. I mean, I don't want today to just be about. Shouldn't be just about race. Yeah, it's not really. I think the reason why we are focusing on ethnicity today is because this is in celebration of Black History Month and we're trying to sort of keep it in context. But hopefully we'll have more conversations like this at a school and as a university and come to the Equal Podcast as well. We intend to have more of this engaging conversations in the future. I'm Shahara. Oh uh, yeah, um, I I kind of wanted to just finish off with a response to Krista's original question about what to, what to say when somebody tells you your accent is really good, um, and this is so I I have this is a true story. Um, <laughs> so one time when I was a shitty little twenty, you know, in my early twenties, I was a bit of a shit. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, this one lady at my workplace who basically uh, said she was very sweet and she meant it complimentarily. But she said, uh, you know, it's amazing. You've got such a great uh, accent. Uh, how did you happen? And, and how did that happen? And I looked at her and I said, well, you know, it's a, just an amazing thing. When I grew up, I couldn't speak a word of English. You know, I was 18 and all I could speak was Urdu, my native language. And I came to the US uh, and, uh, you know, at immigration, they uh, they asked me some questions and I looked at them and I just shook my head because I didn't understand. And so the guy led me to this back room and he put me in this chair and he tied me up and put this metal bowl on my head. <laughs> and all of a sudden he hit the switch and I could speak English. And she's like, what, we have that technology? I was like, yeah, it's amazing. It's like two weeks later when I told her the truth and she never spoke to me again. So that, that's one, one way to deal with that problem. If you feel like being a little shit, um, there people are less likely to believe it these days than they were back in the 2000s. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, especially to our panelists for joining us. Darren, thank you for taking, I don't know, what time is it now in South Africa? I'm not sure. Well, hopefully. It's a two hour time difference. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's true, yeah. So thank you for joining us, Favor, Joel, and Shahari. I think Krista has some final words to say to everyone. 
Yes, I just want to say thank you again from my side as well to everybody. And as a final wrap up, it was very important to the organizers of today's event. So that's Ruth and Io and Laura and myself, that it wouldn't just be a one off, you know, once a year we come together to celebrate diversity and Black History Month kind of thing. But that we would actually get something out of it and have some action points like, you know, that we need to pay more attention to the examples that we use in teaching and such things, and that this is something that we could pursue throughout the year. But also an encouragement to all of you and students and even former students, Darren, other ways of taking this forward is, for example, writing blog articles um, on the, the eco blog. So that's something which I'd really like to see more students take advantage of, uh, writing about your experience at UEA if you're an alumnus that's actually, that would be something new. I think it would be really interesting. So thank you once again, and let's not make this a one-off until we come together again one year from now. Thank you. Shall we Thanks. get on our mics and clap? Like everybody yeah. turn your oh. mics on and clap please. <laughs> oh, that sounds so good. <laughs> I haven't had that in a long time. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth, <laughs> Io, Krista, Laura. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. And Thank everybody you. for taking part. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. I've got, I've got to give up the room now, so I'm going to go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Thank you. Darren, it's nice to see you too here. Um, nice to see Favour too and every other person. Thank you very much. Thank you.